Dr. James Dobson, who is also a minister, interviews Ted Bundy just hours before Bundy is said to be executed. Bundy kidnapped, abused and murdered his female victims and confessed to over 30 homicides. Before his arrest, most people regarded him as trustworthy and persuasive. However, Bundy displayed an almost full range of psychopathic traits and is considered to be a psychopath by a wide range of psychologists. He was cunning, superficially charming, lacked empathy and the ability to feel remorse. He enjoyed torturing his victims, killing them slowly and having absolute control over them. In this interview, we gain a lot of insights into Bundy's personality simply by listening to the words that enter his language. In conversation analysis, which is my primary method, it's understood that the words we choose carry meaning and reveal what's on a person's mind, what's part of a person's agenda or strategy. You ask questions like, what does this word refer back to? How is it being repeated or avoided? Which patterns do we see? And ultimately, how can we characterize the killer based on his language? When analyzing an interview like this, you mark all the words and clauses that indicate deception. Some of the deception markers I will point out and explain during the analysis are Switch pronouns from I to you to share or shift blame. Lack of so-called ownership of the words used. Failing to say my. Answering in the negative. Words that indicate self-awareness. Awareness about the interview and the subject's role in it. Distancing language. Words that distance the subject from the brutal acts he carried out. Longer prefaces that lead up to the subject's answer, rather than the subject answering directly. Prefaces can have a self-serving or deceptive purpose. One of the primary reasons for this interview was Dobson's and allegedly Bundy's shared wish to warn people of the dangers of pornography, and violent pornography in particular. However, Bundy's primarily asked personal and specific questions. And the most important point to keep in mind is that Bundy shows self-serving reasons for participating in this interview, rather than the remorse he's actually given a chance to express. In a full analysis, you don't stop at looking at the language. To get a full profile, you compare the language to the person, Ted Bundy, as assessed by psychologists. So this video is a shortened example of how a conversation analyst would try to break down the language of a serial killer and possible psychopath. Let's go for it. Ted, it is uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, you are scheduled to be executed tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock if you don't receive another stay. What is going through your mind? What thoughts have you had in these last few days? Well, I won't kid you to say that it's something that I feel that I am in control of or something that I've come to terms with because I haven't. Notice that Bundy is answering in the negative here and that he introduces the verb kid. He says, I won't kid you, as if kidding Dobson is something that has actually been on Bundy's mind. Also, we learn about control being an important thing for Bundy. We mark it for sensitivity. Answering in the negative shows us that certain words have entered a person's mind. Just choosing to preface the word with a negative like not or won't. Also sensitive language. For the record, you are guilty of killing many women and girls. Is yes, that yes, that's true. Ted, how did it happen? Take me back. What are the antecedents of the behavior that we've seen? so much grief, so much sorrow, so much pain for so many people. Where did it start? How did this moment come about? That's the question of the hour and, and one that not only people much more intelligent than I have been working on for, uh, for years, but one that I've been working on for years and trying to understand it. Yeah. Is there enough time to explain it all? Uh, I don't know. I think I understand it, though. I understand what happened to me. Um, 
to the extent that I, I, I can see how certain feelings and ideas uh, developed in me to the point where I began to act out on them, certain very violent and very destructive feelings. Notice that Bundy shows awareness of his persona, almost treating himself as a celebrity. He says that's the question of the hour, as if he doesn't know his own motivations, and as if this question is highly important to everybody. Bundy considers himself important, obviously. He then says that people more intelligent than he have been working for years to answer that question. Here Bundy presupposes that you have to be intelligent to even try to figure out his motivations, and also that he himself is intelligent. This appears to be a person who likes being looked at as an enigma. Then he disassociates himself from the murders he committed. He says, I think I understand what happened to me. First off, we notice that Bundy thinks he understands his motivations, meaning he was, after all, smarter than the intelligent people he mentioned. Next, we see that Bundy is taking a passive role here. Something happened to him. He's not the active agent. We also see that when he says, I can see how certain feelings and ideas have developed in me. Bundy doesn't take ownership of these feelings and ideas. They happened to him. They developed in him. They are the main subject, grammatically speaking. Let, let's go back then to those roots. First of all, you, as I understand it, were raised in what you consider to have been a healthy home. Absolutely. You were not physically abused. You were not sexually abused. You were not emotionally abused. No, no way. I, and that's part of the tragedy of this whole situation is because uh, I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents, uh, one of uh, five brothers and sisters. Remember, Bundy has brutally murdered a multitude of women. Still, he's downplaying this fact by saying whole situation, which is an extreme euphemism for what's going on and for what he's done. It also sounds disconnected and distancing. Furthermore, looking at Bundy's childhood, there are many indicators that his was not a wonderful home. For a huge part of his life, he was told his mother was his sister, and there are reports that he was abused by his grandfather. And Bundy also didn't know his biological father. I hope no one will try to take the easy way out and to try to blame or otherwise accuse my, uh, my family of contributing to this because uh, I know, and I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how what happened, and I think this is a message I want to get across. But as a young, uh, a young boy, and I mean the boy of uh, 12 or 13, certainly, uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in... Um, the local grocery store, the local uh, uh, drug store, the softcore pornography, what people call softcore. Um, but as I think I, I explained to you last night, Dr. Dobson, in an anecdote, uh, that as young boys do, we explored the, the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood, and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house, and from time to time we'd come across. So, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic, you might say, more explicit nature than we would encounter, let's say, in your local grocery store. People don't always change. Instead, they reveal. Words reveal what's on our mind, and sometimes they reveal our personalities. Bundy says, I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how. So being honest is something that Bundy is trying to be. It might be that it's a struggle for him, or he's been dishonest in the past, or both. Also, he adds, as I know how. These are unnecessary words, meaning his statement could be understood without these words. Unnecessary words are thus important or sensitive to the person using them. Perhaps we learn here that Bundy can only be honest to a certain extent. No matter what, we learn that honesty for Bundy is point number one, a word that he feels the need to express to the interviewer. And point number two, that honesty is something that he has to know. The way Bundy phrases this makes it sound almost like a strategy he's using. Bundy says he encountered softcore pornography, and he makes himself out to be part of a group by saying, as young boys we explore the back doors and the sideways and byways of our neighborhoods. 
thus generalizing his own personal experiences and actions. Again, a way of disassociating himself from his own experiences, his own decisions. And this is something I think I want to emphasize, is the, 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 the most damaging uh, uh, kinds of pornography. And my, again, I'm talking from personal experience, uh, hard, real, personal experience. The most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence and, and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Three points to this statement. We know that Bundy is a pathological liar, having lied to authorities and having lied to his victims. Ultimately, lying is a narcissistic act. Indirectly and in the moment, you consider the person you're lying to as being too stupid to realize it. The point number one should be that Bundy's way of phrasing it, this is something that I want to emphasize, sounds like a strategy. Again, these are unnecessary words, so they are important or sensitive to the person using them. It could be something he's thought of before this interview, making apologies for his actions while claiming they're not apologies. Point number two, this interview is about Bundy's motivations. But again, we see him generalizing his experiences. He says, the most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence. And he just casually throws himself in there with the addition, and again, I'm talking from personal experience. There's a pattern of Bundy trying to downplay his experiences. It's like he's just one of many. This is also made evident by his following statement. The wedding of those two forces brings about behavior that is just too terrible to describe, where he's generalizing and almost randomly adding, as I know only too well. Same effect, same possible strategy. Also, he's looking at his crimes, or pretending to look at his crimes, from society's point of view, trying to seem like a decent, normal person. Thirdly, he's giving a hint to Dobson that he doesn't want to detail his crimes. He says they're too terrible to describe. We see this again later on when Bundy is asked to detail one of his crimes. Now walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and that, people, that people believe what I'm saying to tell you that, that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things and I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done that's not the question here the question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior here we learn what's important to Bundy it's important to him that people believe what he's saying this can be paralleled with the strategy I mentioned earlier, a self-serving one. Then he seemingly takes full responsibility for his actions. But some points to that. Point number one, taking full responsibility is in large part inconsistent with the wording of his previous statements. Point number two, he says, whatever I've done and all the things I've done, not being specific about his despicable crimes. Point number three, Bundy is skilled at looking through the eyes or pretending to look through the eyes of the world, only to then make apologies for his actions. We see that here where he says, The question is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and shape the kinds of violent behavior. We also note the words, the kinds. He doesn't say my violent behavior or my kind of violent behavior. He's using distancing language. So I would highly question the depth of Bundy's taking full responsibility. It fueled your fantasies. Well, in, in the beginning, it fuels this kind of thought process. Then, it, at a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, making it, in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on, this, on this kind of, these kinds of thoughts. Now, I really want he doesn't say my thought process, he doesn't take ownership, but is again being general. Then he's making himself out to be a victim by saying, making it into something which is almost a separate entity inside. Again, a way of linguistically disassociating himself from his crimes 
and share a shit blame. And it happens, it, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep. I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, yeah, more graphic aggressive. kinds of material. Mm -hmm. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder. Something which which gives you a greater uh, sense of, of, of uh, excitement, until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. You reach mm -hmm. that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. Bear in mind that this interview is or should be about Bundy. He should be our leading role. But again, he's giving himself a supporting role. He says, it happened in stages, it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. And then in between he adds, not to me at least, as if he's just one of many others. He then goes on to say that, like any other kinds of addictions, you keep looking for more potent, more explicit, and so on, thus describing his motivations as any other kind of addiction. This is an indirect way of escaping the responsibility that he previously said he took. Also, we notice his switch of pronouns. He says, you and not I. You keep craving and gives you a greater sense of excitement. Pronouns are significant because we learn them in our very first years. What's yours, what's mine, what's theirs, and so on. Therefore, a shift in pronouns should always be marked as being sensitive. Sensitive to the subject and the overall meaning of what the subject's trying to convey. Would it be accurate to call that a, a, a frenzy, a sexual frenzy? Well, yes, it, that's one way to describe it. A compulsion, a... a, a building up of, of this destructive energy. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, another factor here that we, I haven't mentioned is the use of alcohol. But I think that th what alcohol did, uh, in conjunction with, let's say, my exposure to uh, pornography, was alcohol reduced my inhibitions at the same time. Um, the, uh, the, the fantasy life that was fueled by pornography uh, eroded them further. Bundy introduces another apology or another point to make him seem like a victim of external factors. Alcohol. Claiming alcohol reduced his inhibitions. Presupposing that he actually had inhibitions, like everyone else. And he now says the fantasy life that was fueled with pornography. Bundy sounds like an ordinary guy being exposed to these external entities. We also notice the word compulsion, which can be paralleled with the word addiction that he used earlier. Linguistically, his way of phrasing his answers sounds very much like self-serving excuses, even though Bundy would claim that they're not. And it, it just occurred to me that some people would, would say that, well, I, I've seen that stuff and it doesn't do anything to me. And I can understand that. I don't, Virtually everyone uh, can be exposed to so-called pornography and while they're aroused to it to one degree or another and not go out and do anything wrong. Well, the addictions are like that. They affect some yeah. people more than they affect others. Well, but there is a percentage of people affected by hardcore pornography in a very violent way and you're obviously one of them. That was a major component and I don't know why I was vulnerable to it. All I know is that, uh, that, it, uh, that it had an, an impact on me uh, that was just so uh, central to the development of the violent behavior that I engaged in. Dobson's making conclusions and excuses here, using Bundy's words and opinions. Dobson repeats the word addictions and claims that Bundy is one of potentially many people affected by pornography. This makes it easy for Bundy to hide behind other possible victims of pornography by saying, and I don't know why I was vulnerable to it. Also notice Bundy's phrasing, the violent behavior that I engaged in. He doesn't say, my violent behavior. 
Again, no ownership. It's like the violent behavior is an entity in and of itself that Bundy took part in, fueled by pornography and now also alcohol. Ted, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Well, again, this, please understand that, that even all these years later, it is very difficult to, to talk it's about difficult. it and, to, and, and reliving it through talking about it uh, is, is uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it, remember what happened and realize that basically, I mean, in, in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of God, you're responsible uh, to have to wake up in the morning and, and realize what I had done. And with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment, uh, uh, absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. Firstly, Bundy says it's difficult to talk about, which is similar to his earlier statement that the crimes were too terrible to describe. Secondly, he says, but I want you to understand what happened. But we should note that so far, Bundy hasn't been very detailed about the murders, claiming it causes him too much pain to talk about. And the sentence is unnecessary to the context of Dobson's question. So it might be a strategy to seem sincere, to seem honest, which would be consistent with his self-serving statements prior to this one. Again, he's making the killer in him seem like a separate entity by stating he viewed the murders as having been possessed by something. He then adds utterances like, wake up in the morning and realize what I had done with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact, presupposing he actually had morals, just like everybody else. Again, we see his attempts at trying to seem and sound like an ordinary person. You really hadn't known that before? Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe first the brutal urge to do that kind of thing and then what happens is once it it has been more or less satisfied and recedes you might say or is spent that, that sense that the kind of energy level recedes and basically I became my myself again I, I want people to understand this too and I'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important that people understand this that basically I was a normal person uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum or um, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that you know people look at somebody and say I know there's something wrong with him and just tell I mean I I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. The brutal urge to do that kind of thing is distancing language. Not only is he not being specific, he's also using that instead of this, indicating that this thing is far away from him. Next, he says, I want people to understand this too. He has used this way of phrasing his answers before. He has said that he wants people to believe what he's saying, and he said that he wants Dobson to understand what happened. Again, we mark this as deceptive language unnecessary words, language that could be part of a strategy, that Bundy doesn't really believe many of the things he's saying, but wants people to believe them. This is reiterated by the following. It is important that people understand this. Important to whom? 
Bundy's legacy, Bundy's excuses, one might wonder. When people speak in the negative about who or what they are, their words become sensitive to the conversation analyst. Here Bundy says, I wasn't a pervert, followed by moderation, in the sense that, and so forth. First of all, we should note that Bundy indeed was a pervert in almost every sense of the word. Without getting to graphic, he was a sexual deviant on pretty much all counts. Maybe that's why he's making the moderation in the first place. He knows he's a pervert and or is considered to be one, but not in the sense that he claims here, and he is indeed claiming. Without getting too deep into the science of body language, Bundy's touching of his nose while saying I wasn't a pervert should be mentioned. We see touching of a person's face when they're lying, and the touching of the nose is called the Pinocchio effect. Bundy then continues to downplay the small but very potent and destructive segment of his personality, just like he's done several places during this interview. He's using minimizing language. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy, and I'm, uh, I mean, that wasn't perfect, but it was, it, I want yeah, to be quite can, candid with you, I was, it, yeah. I was okay, okay, uh, I was. Uh, the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it, unfortunately it became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who are who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home. It snatched me out of my home. 20, 30 years ago, and, and as diligent as my parents were, uh, and they were diligent in protecting their children, and as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the kinds, that, the kinds of influences that are loose in a society that, that, that tolerates. Bundy continues to put himself in a passive role. He says his basic humanity became overwhelmed at times, also making it sound like his urges to kill were temporary and perhaps even rare. Bundy then associates with many others, but in a more direct way than previously. He says, we are your sons and we are your husbands, and so on. Here he's speaking directly to the viewer, and his victim narrative is much clearer here making it sound like external forces drive him and others towards committing the same types of crimes. Now pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house, just like it snatched Bundy out of his house, apparently, as if Bundy is like any kid. Again, pornography is given full agency as the main subject. He ends with, there's no protection against the kinds of influences that are loose in the society letting Dobson and the viewers know that these influences are ongoing and could potentially influence other people. It's like the influences have a will of their own. Uh, I'm sure, Teddy, if, you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours, are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families? Well, who are so wounded, you know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? Again, I, I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. But through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I've much too late, but better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases, murders that I was involved in. And it's hard to 
it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and diligently dealt with, and I think successfully, with the love of God. And yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that. And I can only hope that those who I have harmed, those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, will believe what I'm saying now, that there is loose in their towns and their communities people like me today whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. And what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is, in my formative stages. And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, <laughs> some of the movies, I mean, some of the violence in the movies uh, that come into homes today with stuff that they, that they wouldn't show in yeah. X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago. This stuff... Bundy is using the exact word, self-serving, that I've pointed out several times. So the word has crossed Bundy's mind as well. This shows a huge amount of self-awareness on Bundy's part. His, I'm just telling you how I feel, sounds as if he's trying to persuade rather than it actually sounds sincere or true. Because in the context of his previous statements, he's actually holding back and not being completely forthcoming. Bundy says he now feels the hurt and pain that he's responsible for. But in the next sentence, we again see distancing language when it comes to mentioning murders. He says, murders I was involved in, not committed, but involved in. This matches the distancing language in the large majority of his previous statements. Also, Bundy says, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, he doesn't say that I'm sorry or my sorrow, but my expression of sorrow and remorse. The word expression shows self-awareness about what this interview is for and can make his alleged sorrow sound calculating. The last part where Bundy says he's scared by the stuff they show on TV Bundy linguistically comes across as a concerned citizen, again able to jump in and out of different roles, from the perverted but supposedly remorseful murderer to the ordinary virtuous citizen. He's often been referred to as a chameleon that adapts easily to the worldview of the person he's talking to. And the final and most basic point, he was asked if he feels remorse. Is there remorse there? And he doesn't have a simple yes answer to that question, which would be an easy question to any ordinary person. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you, from personal experience, the most, that is graphic violence mm -hmm. on screen, particularly as it gets into the home yeah. to children who may be unattended or, or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that, that vulnerability to that, that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of, of, of uh, movie, that kind of violence. There are kids sitting out there, switching the TV dial around and come upon these movies late at night, or I don't know when they're on, but they're on, and any kid can watch them. It's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen, I mean, scary enough. <laughs> I mean, that I just ran into stuff outside the home, but to, be, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today or can pick up their phone and dial away for it or send away for it. Uh. He's making a general point about violence on screen. Again, pointing away from himself, only using himself as additional proof of this bigger point. Now he's talking about all children, all people. And he refers to himself in the third person, Ted Bundy, which shows self-awareness about his persona, a thinly disguised love of the image he has in the public eye. 
Bundy's victim narrative continues with distancing language, that vulnerability and that predisposition. Once again, he's just one of many, supposedly, who can be influenced by graphic violence on screen. He says by that kind of behavior, and once again, he's presupposing that that kind of behavior exists as a general thing. He's just one of many. And he's not specific about what the behavior entails. It's just behavior. Can you help me understand this desensitization process that took place? Uh, what was going on in your mind? Well, by desensitization, I, I describe it in specific terms is that each time I'd harm someone, each time I'd kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, uh, especially at first, uh, enormous amount of, of, of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards. But then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. Now, believe me, I didn't... It, it, the unique thing about how this worked, Dr. Dobson, is that I still felt in my regular life the full range of, of guilt and, and uh, remorse about other things, uh, regret and... Uh, you Notice that Dobson asked Bundy what was going on in Bundy's mind. Bundy starts off by saying, I'd describe it in specific terms. He makes a lot of these prefaces before he answers. Earlier, we heard him preface his answers with, I'll tell you as honestly as I know how, and it's important for me that people believe what I'm saying. This all shows the same kind of self-awareness. A person trying to show that he attends to the interviewer's questions in great detail, but his answers are usually surface level and sometimes untrue. For example, about the wonderful home he says he grew up in. He then says, I'd harm someone but modifies it to, I killed someone, through a process that conversation analysis calls self-repair. Here he goes from the euphemism harm to the actual thing he did, which is kill people. Again, we see the duality that's present in Bundy's language, the sometimes direct way of describing what he did versus the sugarcoating that he does most of the time. He says the impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. Notice that Bundy is taking a passive role here. It's not him taking ownership of this impulse. He says the impulse comes, but not even to him. He doesn't say to me or my impulse. He's not even in the picture here. Bundy says, now believe me, which is deceptive language because it sounds calculating. Being believed appears to be Bundy's main goal with this interview. He then says, the unique thing about how this worked, Dr. Dobson. Unique is a very misplaced word in describing a thought process that he himself supposedly finds terrible. Using the word unique might reveal to us that Bundy has some positive attitudes towards the behavior he says he finds terrible. Also, about how this worked is distancing language where Bundy takes the position of a bystander to things he acted out himself. Let's not forget that. He also mentions the interviewer's title and last name, thus making himself familiar with Dobson and showing that he respects him, which may or may not be the case, and is now sharing with him on a deep and or intimate level. However, the things that Bundy shares, he always turns to something beneficial for himself. As we see here, he says he felt the full range of remorse and guilt. So is he really sharing on a deep and or intimate level? Doesn't completely sound like it. And uh, you had this compartmentalized... This compartmentalized, very well focused, uh, 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 very sharply focused area where I, it was like a black hole. It was like a, you know, like a crack and everything that fell into that crack just disappeared. Does that make sense? Yeah. Notice how Bundy again reuses Dobson's words, which is also called parroting. As human beings, we reuse each other's words and definitions in daily conversations all the time. Dobson's way of phrasing this loaded question allows for Bundy to further downplay the killer inside him by saying it was like a crack and everything that fell into that crack just disappeared. He even asks Dobson, does that make sense? indicating that he hasn't thought about it like this before and that he doesn't know if it makes sense. It does. Uh, one of the, the final uh, 
murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... Uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's... Oh, yeah. That's too painful. I would like to... Uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that... that... Uh, that experience is like, but I can't, that I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. Dobson brings up Kimberly Leach, whom Bundy abused sexually and murdered. Bundy says, I can't really talk about that right now, and then says that again before he stops himself. That is distancing language. Plus, if he's not able to talk about that right now, he never will be ready. Bear in mind, this is just hours before his execution. He says he won't be able to talk about that. But again, says who? He's setting the boundaries himself, despite claiming he wants to be as specific and honest as possible. During the entire interview, Bundy's demeanor is humble and apologetic. However, here we see a slight glimpse of anger and resentment in Bundy's face before he returns to being humble and apologetic. Perhaps he didn't care for this very specific question. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have, and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. And I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. That, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. Bundy says, I can't begin to understand two times. And he could be right. Maybe his language use is true here. Maybe he really can't understand basic human emotions of the parents of the children he harmed, once again using the euphemism harm. He also says he won't pretend to be able to restore much to them. Again, why does the word pretend enter his language? Might it be for the same reason he used the verb kid in the beginning of the interview? I won't kid you. It's the same construction type. We have a negative won't followed by a verb that shows self-awareness and a deceptive mind. Do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I'll answer it very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has, and I deserve I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me, that's for sure. Uh, I think what I, what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because, because of we, as, as we've been talking, there are, there are forces that loose in, in, in this country, particularly, again, uh, this kind of violent uh, pornography, uh, where on the one hand, well-meaning, decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a, a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundys. That's the irony. Bundy says, I'll answer very honestly. Again, why does the word enter his language for the second time? Why is being honest something that he has to mention? Why is it not just presupposed? The word hints at Bundy not having been honest during the interview and or distinguishing between different levels of honesty. No matter what, it shows self-awareness and along with the following I'm not gonna kid you, I kid you not, points at deceptive language use. 
just like the verb pretend did. Then Bundy continues to hide behind other potential Ted Bundys that are sent down the road to be Ted Bundys. Again, agency is removed from Bundy's language. He's in large part blaming personal decisions on external influences. The interview ends shortly hereafter. Bundy was put to death in the electric chair. Thanks for watching.